plug them to the box, right? Get to the media computer. They used to put those adapters on the unit. They were just plugging them on. I have no idea on that. So if you guys work on the media computers.
Please rise or we will be standing as we're doing the tour off in the case of the arm. This is the Torah, to which our Messiah Yeshua occurred when he said, If you believe Moshe and the prophets, you wouldn't believe me, for it was they who spoke of me. This is the Torah that testifies that Yeshua is our promised Messiah. This is the word of God, and a symbol of Yeshua himself, who is the living word. Shema, 
which is Deuteronomy 6.4, and Nevea Hapha, which is the rest of that passage in Deuteronomy 6.5-9. If you know it in the Hebrew, please join me. Uh, if you don't, then we'll recite it together in the English Advent. If you've been here before, um, you remember my voice is not where it usually is. It's probably going to be a lot lower, so just uh, bear with me and join me. And let the, let the words, uh, the spirit behind the words carry you. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai The, the 
ישמור מצוותיי, וחוקותיו ומשפטיו. אמן. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוקינו מלך העולם, אשר נתן לנו תורת אמת, לחיי עולם נתן בתוכנו. ברוך אתה אדוני נותן התורה. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This morning's Torah portion comes from the middle column. Amen. The rest of you may be seated. Okay. 
We'll invite the readers to make themselves ready. And while the readers are making themselves ready, we'll remind ourselves why we're getting ready to do what we're getting ready to do. And what we're getting ready to do is hear three passages from the scripture. We're going to hear a passage we call our Torah portion. We're going to hear a passage we call our Haftarah portion. And we're going to hear a passage we call our Shah portion. This is some place from the first five books. This is some place from the rest of the Old Testament and some place from the New Testament. The reason we do this is because after our Messiah Yeshua had been crucified, buried, resurrected, he came back to teach his disciples everything they were going to need to know. And we read about this in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 and 45, which says, Then he said to them, These were the words that I spoke to you while I was still living, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses as the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might come. And so after all of that, he came out and taught his disciples everything they were going to need to know about himself from the law of Moses. Well, that's our Torah portion. We'll read that. This morning's Torah portion is Parshat Beats, as I mentioned, in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And then it says he taught all the things that they were going to need to know about him from the prophets and the Psalms. Well, that's someplace else in the Old Testament, or the Tanakh and Pot. We read uh, this morning our Haftar portion from the prophet Yishiyam, the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 62. This is the seventh and final um, Haftarah of, haftar of comfort, uh, leading right up to the high holy day of Yom Tevah, or what we call Rosh Hashanah. And then it says, he opened to their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And this is, of course, his interpretation, his explanation, his words, or the enlightenment of everything that had come before by the power of the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. And we read about that in, of course, the Brit Hadashah, or the New Testament. So we'll read a portion from there this morning's uh, Brit Hadashah passage from the Gospel according to John in chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Vaha Ebrenenu, Bikon Etahem, and Yimek Rebenu, Rebenu, Enlighten our eyes to your scriptures. May our hearts become one with your commandment, with your word uh, this morning, even as they have become one with the Baruch the living word, which is none other than the shield of the Messiah, and is in his name we pray. Amen. Readers, you are up. Look, I am presenting you today with, on the one hand, life and good, and on the other, death and evil. And that I am ordering you today to love and deny your God, to follow his ways, and to obey his mitzvot, regulations and rules. For if you do, you will live and increase your numbers. And that deny your God will bless you in the land you are entering in order to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, if you refuse to listen, if you are drawn away to prostrate yourself before other gods and serve them, I'm announcing to you today that you will certainly perish. You will not live long the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call on heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have presented you with life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, <coughs> choose life so that you will live, you and your descendants. Loving Adonai your God, paying attention to what he says and clinging to him, for that is the purpose of your life. On this depends the length of time you will live in the land Adonai swore he would give to your ancestors, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov.
they will, then you will be called by a new name, which Adonai himself will pronounce. It will be a glorious crown in the hand of Adonai, a royal diadem held by your God. You will no longer be spoken of as the Zuvah, abandoned, or your land be spoken of as Shemama, desolate. Rather, you will be called Heftazeba, my delight is in her, and your land, you are married. For Adonai delights in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, your sons will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, your God will rejoice over you. I have pushed the watchmen on the walls of your shore. They will never fall silent, neither by day nor by night. You who call on Adonai, give yourselves no rest. And give him the rest till he restores Jerusalem and makes it a praise on earth. Adonai is formed by his right hand, by his mighty arm. Never again will I give your grain to your enemies as food, nor will strangers drink your wine, for which you work so hard. But those who harvest the grain will eat it, with praises to Adonai. Those who gather the wine will drink it in the courtyards of my sanctuary.
contract terms. Um, really is, is what it is. He's laying out before the children of Israel who is making the covenant and who he's making the covenant with. He says, I am making this covenant here with you today. But not just with those of you standing here today. With all those people who are yet to even come, those are who I am making this covenant with. Then he says, look, let's be honest with you, be real. I know you're going to tell me. I know. And it probably won't take very long either. So, so I'm going to tell you that when you break the covenant, not if, and when you break the covenant, God will still keep his part of life. God is still going to be faithful even when you are not and not able to. God will always remain faithful. And not only will he remain faithful to, to his part of the covenant, but he will be faithful to restore you to your part of the covenant. That's the nature of our God. We call this covenantal faithfulness righteousness. That's what righteousness is. It's being faithful to the covenant that was made. God is ultimate righteousness because he will always and forever be faithful to the covenant that he made. When we are faithful to the covenant, we are deemed righteous. That's when God says to Abraham that righteousness was accredited to him. It was accredited to him as righteousness. It was as if he had been faithful to the entire covenant. That's the covenantal faithfulness is its righteousness. But here's the bottom line. At the end of this passage, he says, this is the deal. This is the covenant. This is what happens when you break the covenant. This is what happens when you keep the covenant. But I am not going to force you into this covenant. The choice is still yours. See, I have set before today, before you today, a choice. I set before you life and good. I also set before you, we don't think about God setting this before you. I set before you also death and evil. Uh, be your special mind, our Father in heaven. You are a great and glorious God and King, and your Torah teaches us life, Father. And then you gave us the living Torah, the living word, in your Son, Yeshua, the Messiah. And now he dwells within us, and he is our life. Father, show us, Father, Lord, today how to walk in the life that you have given us. So that our joy may be your joy, that our joy may be filled. Thank you, Lord, for your love, for your mercy, and for your glory. It's in his name we pray. Yeshua on the Son. Amen. Let's watch this video. Okay. 
Who'd you name the movie? Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web. How many of you, by a show of hands, love Spider Man? Yeah, that, Spider -Man. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Now, you probably thought I was going in a different, a different direction with that. I love the movie, or I love Wilbur, or whatever. the barn loved spiders. Wilbur made Charlotte his friend. Wilbur made a choice to love the spider. And by loving the spider, who either everybody else in the barn didn't know but didn't take the care for it. And showing that love, and sharing that love, the other people, or the other people, I'm just gonna like, the dog and stuff, the other animals in the barn, grew to love the spider too. Through his relationship with Charlotte, others learned to have a relationship with her too. Torah teaches that loving God is the most important thing we can do. That loving God and having a relationship with Him is life. When He teaches us in His Word today, in the end of the portion this morning, you know, all of these commandments, all of these things that you're going to do are how you love me. If you love me, obey my commandments. We see that over and over throughout the Scriptures. In both the Torah and the Great Kadasha, if you love me, obey my commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. Love the Lord your God. His commandments should be in you. If you love me, obey me. If you obey me, you will have life according to the Torah. Therefore, if you love God and have a relationship with God, you will have life. That's what the Torah teaches. That's what life is. Through that relationship, through your relationship to God, and the life that you have as a result of that relationship, others will learn to love Him too. That's the gospel. That's what we're going to talk about really today. Focus on the Word and the Gospel. Now, what we're truly talking about is this concept of fruit. How many of you like fruit? fruit. I love fruit. I don't eat hardly enough of it, I'll be honest with you. But I love fruit. God, the, the great kind of saw passage for this, for this portion is John 15, verse 1, verses 1 to 11 which uh, was skillfully read by our, our brother and thank you for that. What does a tree have to do in order to bear fruit? Assuming it's a fruit-bearing tree, okay, let's make that assumption. Okay, what does that tree have to do to bear fruit? There's a lot of branches. Nothing. The tree don't have to do nothing. 
That's what it does. It just has to be the truth. All it has to do is not try to be something it isn't, and it will bear its fruit. It just has to be a tree. A tree doesn't have the option to not be a tree. God didn't say to the tree, all right, tree, choose what you're going to be. We, on the other hand, we get the option. God gave us, think about it this way, God gave us the option to not be who we were created to be. We were created to be in relationship with Him. We were created to be fruit bearers. We were created to be word bearers. We were created to be light bearers. And yet God has given us the option to not be what we were created to be in the Torah. Choose to be who you are. If you are who you were created to be, and you're choosing to be that, you will not have anything to worry about. You will have life. You will have life more abundantly, and you will bear fruit. Because right. you will be in relationship with me. That's what it's about. It's about relationship with God. But you have the choice. What do you choose not to be? Who you were created to be. You might still bear fruit. But that fruit would be poison. What does it take to be who you were created to be? In this world, the things that we say that come naturally are the things that we are supposed to not do. It's very, very easy to be selfish. It is very, very easy to search and seek out convenience. Those are the things that we are supposed to not do. We're supposed to not look for selfish things. We're supposed to not just look for convenience, but righteousness. We are supposed to do the things that come unnaturally. That's what we are supposed to do. And that's all it takes to choose life. Choosing life in this particular case is not natural. It's unnatural. And it's what makes you different. We've talked about this for the past three weeks. You are called to be holy. You are called to be sanctified. You are called to be set apart, which means you are called to be different, which means that the things that you are supposed to do will be unnatural to this world. And this is what we are called to do, to choose life. Love the Lord your God. This is what it takes to love, to, to choose life, according to our scripture this morning. It says, love the Lord your God. First of all, that's going to be unnatural. Because there's so many other things in this world that we're called upon to love. Love job, love money, love car, love house, love spouse, love children, love this, love that, love shopping, love sports, love this. There are all kinds of other things that we are called upon to love in this world that would be seen as natural. Loving the Lord your God at first, not natural. Loving spiders, Definitely not natural. But that's what we're called to do. Love the Lord your God. Obey His voice. First of all, if you ever tell people, I'm hearing the voice of God, they're going to look at you freaky anyway. <laughs> Obey His voice. His voice speaks through His Word. His Word is the Scriptures, the Bible, and His Word is the living Messiah who dwells within you. This is the voice to which we listen to. That's not going to be natural. There are all kinds of other voices you're hearing. The voice of your boss. The voice of your mother. The voice of your spouse. The voice of the evil one. Who will, by the way, sound a lot like yourself in your head. There are all kinds of other voices. But listening to the voice of the Lord is not going to be natural. But that's what it takes 
That's what loving the Lord is. That's what being who we are created to be is about. It's just hold fast to Him. Once you hold on, once you grasp on, there are going to be people that say that you're unnatural. Because they're going to be different. You're going there on what day? That's weird. Come on, send it. That's natural. Hold fast. Hold fast to his word. Hold fast to him. Fruit comes from that relationship. The relationship where you love the Lord your God, you listen to his voice, and you hold fast to him no matter what the world tells you. That's the relationship. That's who we were created to be. Now, we have to hear his voice. What does that take? Where do we hear his voice? We just said hear his voice is important. You've got to be in his word. You've got to be reading the scriptures. It's okay how many years I've been doing this. And as far as I can tell, unless our website had gone down for any particular period of time, the scripture passages that we are that we talk about every Shabbat. Are listed on our website. In fact, they're listed there with, and you just have to click them, and there's a link there so you can read the actual passages that we'll be talking about every single Shabbat. And yet, probably 80% of the people who attend don't read it. Now, not an accusation, we're busy, we're all busy. We've got all kinds of other things vying for our time. But I'm going to tell you, if you're not listening, you're not going to hear. God is speaking to you all the time. All the time. Are you listening? You cannot hear if you're not listening. Because there will be plenty of things to drown out what's in the Word of God. There will be plenty of other voices. There will be plenty of other things. Your education will get in the way. Your boss will get in the way. The television will get in the way. You've got to be willing to listen to the voice of God. His voice is His Word. In fact, it says in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, My Word be which go forth from my mouth. My Word be which go forth from my mouth. This, the word of God, is his word. In fact, in our pastoral portion this morning, we, we hear a lot about voice, about speaking, and not just about God speaking, about us speaking. This is part of it. In, in, uh, in Isaiah 62, verse 2, it says, You will be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will pronounce or will designate. It's already in the So God is still speaking. He's speaking through the prophets. He's pronouncing upon you things even now. And what is our response? To obey His voice. We hear, we obey. In fact, when we closed our men's Bibles, Bibles, and prayer this, this morning, we, we closed, and the prayer included the statement, may we be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. What good does it do to hear it and not do it? We've got to be doers of the word and not just hearers. He still commands us to speak. Through his word. We read it all the time. We read it today in our in our half word portion. There is power in the word. He says, For Zion's sake, I will never speak up. Right? For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. Let's talk about that. When my second grandson was born, um, he is born with autism, and 
is from being brought apart. And we became worried that maybe this was going to be a persistent problem that was definitely not the case. Now, there are times when we're doing whatever we're doing, and in the background, he's just going and going and going, and he's like the little engine that could, that never stopped, and just continued up the hill, and he just never stops talking. He continues and continues to talk. And he'll start asking questions, and you don't even know what he's asking, he's just talking. And he sometimes he's talking, talking, he hears himself talk. And that's okay, because that's what he does, he's just talking, and you can't get him quiet, because he just keeps going, and you can just go do your own thing, and then it'll be behind talking, and he's sort of, That is not to keep silent. Is that how you are with God? No matter what he's doing. And believe me, I understand. He's probably pretty busy. No matter what he's doing, are you sitting or standing around him talking to him all the time? Never keeping silent. Think about that. Think about that. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, most Bible translations say, I will not hold my peace. You know, the, 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 the Hebrew really is more like, I will not keep quiet. You are always make noise for the Lord. Now, what does making noise for the Lord sound like? At any given time, it can be done, Daddy, please! Or thank you, God! Or ah! Whatever you are feeling, whatever your emotions are with the Lord, never hold your peace. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. Okay, so all day, all night. So when can you keep silent? When you're sleeping, right? No, 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 never. Even in your dreams, even in your dreams, never keep quiet before the Lord. Now, obviously, you have no control over your dreams, but the more you the more you put this into routine practice, the easier it will be to always stay before the Lord and never give Him any rest until He makes Jerusalem the praise of the earth. Now, when does that happen? When does that happen? When does Jerusalem become a praise in the earth? When Yeshua returns, because what is he going to do? He's going to establish his kingdom in the temple in Jerusalem and rule from it as a living, earthly king. Come back to reign. And that day, Jerusalem will be a praise in the earth. That's when you can stop. And then it's funny, because while the Bible says that's when you can stop, that's when you're not going to want to stop. You're going to want to continue to praise Him all day and all night. Do not give Him any rest until He makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Yeshua is the Word, the living Word. The Word for life is Chai. The Word for Word is Davar. Hadavar Hachai. The living Word. That's Yeshua, the Messiah. And He is the Word of God. He is the voice of God whom we obey for life in order to enter the relationship with God. Remember, this is all about loving the Lord and about being in a such tight relationship with Him that others see it and want to emulate it the same way that Wilbur loved the spider so much that others began to love the spider too. When you love God and are in relationship with God so much that it's evident to everybody who sees you that you are in love with God, that they will want to be in love with Him too. What about the fruit? We started talking about the fruit. What about the fruit? 
Paul talks about the, the, the need to transform others. And you guys know I've been talking a lot about the word, a lot about evangelism. And that's sort of where I see our vision for this year, is talking about the word and using the word for evangelism to bring the good news of Yeshua the Messiah to the world who needs it. This is what Paul is talking about. When he sees, says that, that lives need to be transformed. We have to transform them. Yeah. That's sort of a misnomer. Because when I say that we need to transform lives, that sort of gives the impression that you go out and you save people. Put another knock to your belt. And that's the firmest thing you can do. You can save no one. No one. No one. God can use you to introduce him to them because it's about the relationship. But how will they know if they don't hear? It's the same thing as we say, how are you going to hear the voice of the Lord if you're not in the Word? How, are, how is anybody else going to know if they're not hearing it? And how is anybody going to hear it if nobody is speaking it? This is what Romans chapter 10 is all about. How is anyone going to tell them if nobody is sent to them? When we talk about staying in connection with Messiah and about staying in that relationship, we are sent. Paul says that we are his epistles. We are God's epistles to the world. God is writing his love letter to the world through us. And that will only be evident in as much as we stay in that loving relationship with God. And he mentions our Torah portion as an example of righteousness based on faith. This is what Paul is talking about. And this becomes, so we started reading this morning's portion in verse 15. Um, verses 11 through 14 are really significant. And they truly point to our Messiah, Yeshua, the living word, and who he is. As Moses says to the people, y'all can do this. The word, my word, God's word, isn't far away from you. It's not up above or beyond the heavens and you can't go and reach it. It's not, it's not beyond the sea. That you have to go and sail and go and find it, come back. God's word is near to you. It's in your mouth. And it's in your heart. God's word is near to you. God's word is the Son of Yeshua. And you better believe he is very useful. If you believe in him and have placed your trust in him as your Lord and Savior, he is as near to you as can possibly be for he is in you. That's the whole concept of the new covenant. When God says, Behold, a day is coming, when I will make a new covenant, that's the New Testament, by the way. A new covenant, the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I've even done before, but a new covenant in which I will put my law in the inner hearts. I will write it on their heart. I will forgive their iniquities. And I will remember their sins no more. I will take them to be my people. And I shall be their God. God has, through the power of His Son, put His Word in you. So yes, right now, it is near to you. It is not just on your lips, but it is in your heart, as the words has already said. That's the love that we need to show the rest of the world as we go forth. As we show our relationship with God and others, We'll get, we'll, we'll catch that. Our love of God will become contagious. And I'll just say that because I'm sick. 
God's love will become contagious. And ladies and gentlemen, we talk a lot about fruit. There is no greater fruit than sharing the love of God. Others need to know the love of God. That's not the fact. There is the fruit. When that happens, our fruit will change the world. As we prepare for Rosh Hashanah, which begins tomorrow night, let's make a commitment to allow our love of God this year to go viral. So I'll say that. For any other reason, let's pray. I'll give you so much love, our Father in heaven. Lord, we are so grateful that you love us. We are so grateful for that, even the fact that when we don't show our love for you, you still show your love for us. That's your faithfulness, Father. That's your covenantal faithfulness, your righteousness, Father. And thank you for sending your Son to be our righteousness. That you have given your living word to dwell within us, that we might stay in relationship with you all the time. That you have given us the power of your Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to continue to keep us connected to you, because he is part of you and he lives in us. Now, Father, as we go forth, out into the world, help our love for you be a guiding light for others, that they might come to see and know that you are God, and that you have set your Son for them, because you love them too. Thank you, Father, for this year. Thank you, Father, for the high holy is coming up, where we ask you to make them a blessing, even as you um, seek to draw others to you. This is the greatest blessing of all, to know you, to love you, and to worship you in the spirit and the truth. We thank you, Father, for your son, who made it all possible, Yeshua, on the side.
and it tripped up here. Ah, oh, wonderful to have been in the house of the Lord. But guess what? It's not over. We certainly welcome our, our first time visitors. This is my home for first time visitors. You're just family we met this morning. How about that? And those of you who have been here before and you're back with us, we are absolutely delighted to have you back also. Immediately following the service, I told you what number, there will be a time of fellowship out here in the uh, entry way. Uh, on egg. Uh, we've got some light refreshments, coffee, lemonade, tea, and a bunch of water. Um, and just, you know, some cookies, a little bit of fruit, like we're about to talk about earlier. Just a little bit of food. So hang around, get to know us, let us get to know you. Talk to somebody you haven't talked to in a while or you've never talked to pretty much in a period of time, perhaps. It's always good to know your family. Um, let's see. Nine visitors. They, oh, yeah. Those folks who are following us online, we are glad to have you join us, whether you are watching right now or you will tune in at some point later in the week. Television days. Anyway, we have a few people that you have with us also. For your convenience, if you are here, the Sadaka box is on the table in the back of the room. Uh, that's for your tithes and offerings. Of course, just whatever you do, do it with joy. And we will be here to start over. If you're online, uh, I think PayPal is still an option. PayPal is still an option, so you are. Um, but uh, we want to let you know that that was there for your convenience also. Prayers. We have a lot of prayer requests. Uh, Steve Magnus is not doing well, and there's most of them done. So continue to hold him up in prayers as well as the rest of that family. For those of you who don't know about Little Walls, uh, she had a T-I-A, I won't try to repeat what the name of the thing really is. It's a fashion dress. It's not a fashion dress. It's not a dress. It is commonly known as a pin stroke. Um, I don't remember what day it was, Tuesday or Wednesday, anyway. She was, there was a possibility she would go home today from the hospital. And the latest is that that is not going to happen. So the Wall Street case, um, your prayer is awesome. I've heard a lot of folks talking about just Fatigue that is beyond description, and of course, there's illness going around. So, there are a lot of folks who may have this. We can attribute that to a lot of different things. First of all, our adversary the devil, doesn't want us to thrive and prosper, doesn't want us to do well here. But through God's grace, through His strength, we will be victorious in that. We will do well in. Let's see, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock is our Rosh Hashanah service. Is that right? Is that 6 o'clock? Okay. And that will be here. It will be a short service, uh, just a few light refreshments afterwards. And then I'll let the Reverend give the details later, but I think they're, uh, yeah, I'll let the Reverend give the details later. And then, of course, we've got Young Kirk coming up. And this is going to come up this month also. Uh, and I don't know of any other announcements, so I will be quiet and let the red light continue with this. Never right. be quiet. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> but I won't say what comes in. Alright, so, <clears throat> latest update on Lena Walls. Um, it was actually diagnosed as a stroke. Um, there, it, she says, look at the direction, two areas that were affected, um, two areas of the brain. Um, she's definitely not going home today because there's still some residual dizziness. I want to make sure it's not a new event. Um, the residents and I will be going over shortly after service. So it's 
expensive tie down the page. Um, let's see. There is, there is some, you know, some areas of brain damage that have the residual effect that she's slightly dizzy as a change of head. Um, there's a slight wobbling in her body. So that's where she is right now, so please keep her in your prayers. Um, any of you have ever had any experience with stroke or stroke victims, we know that this is still mild when compared to what it could be. Um, she's talking, she's texting, um, she's walking. So she is, you know, this is this is still um, really mild. So she's praising God that it is not um, that it was not a much worse event. Um, but they still need a lot of prayers. If you are interested, we are going to be putting together um, a sort of a food service for them. If you're interested in providing food um, for the Walls family, if you don't know who the Walls family is, um, they're the ones who have five kids that have been So there's a lot. That, um, that they will need. Uh, please get with uh, Revitz and Kim, uh, who will be, will be putting together that food, food service for them. She has a list of what they like and what they need, uh, and so kind of look up her, uh, and she'll help you with that. As far as the high quality times, um, Brother Phil was correct. Our Rosh Hashanah evening service will be tomorrow evening here at 6 p.m. Um, by short service, I know most people have like, had this idea of a short church service to be like 45 minutes. Okay? A short messianic congregation service is about an hour and a half. So um, just be prepared for that. Uh, our day service on um, Monday morning is 10.45 right here. We will go after um, that service to Franklin Park for a uh, little quick ceremony, what we call Tashri. This is based on the uh, concept that God said he will cast our sins out into the sea. Um, and so we go and we take leaven bread. Leaven represents sin uh, throughout the scripture. We take leaven bread and we toss it into a body of water. We're either in the sink, it will float, or the dust will take it away. Either way, it's not part of us anymore. And so that's what that, that ceremony represents. Um, and that will be immediately following our service tomorrow, or on Monday, Monday and probably about one point thirty years. Um, then our, we will have regular Shabbat services on Saturday the 15th. Um, the next service will be our Erev Yom Kippur service, which will be Tuesday evening, the 18th. That will be here at 7 p.m. It's 7 p.m. It's not 6, it's 7 p.m. Um, because of the work week and everything like that, uh, we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get here. Tuesday evening, so we made a little bit later, so 7 o'clock on Tuesday. Wednesday is an all-day affair, right? Wednesday for Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, we'll begin our service at 1045, which is our normal morning service start time. Um, that will go until our normal service stop time, 1245-ish, 1 o'clock. Uh, we'll take a break. We will come back at 3.30. At 3.30, we will just start our interactive reading of the book of Jonah. Okay, do we see 3.30 or 4? We have done it, 3.30. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with, with Jonah, with chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to read it together, and we're going to discuss it. We'll do like 10 verses at a time, and we'd love to get your insights on what you think this, this book is all about. So that'll be from, from 3 30 to about 5 30. We'll break for about half an hour so everyone can get you get together. And we'll do what we call our Neila service um, on Wednesday evening at 6. Neila is the Hebrew word for closing. It's what closes officially behind that, that high holy period. And um, that will be about 6. Shortly after the Neila service, we will do our break fast for those of us who are fasting for the holiday. And we will, we will do that until we can't break our mask anymore. So we're, we're broken, I guess. <coughs> our celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot will be our regular um, Saturday service on um, the 29th. That is what we call officially the Kol Hamoy Shabbat, um, which is the, the intermediate festival Sabbath. Uh, and that'll be again the 29th in our service will be a 10:45 service. 
If you have any questions, um, I will post those on our website as soon as I can figure out how to operate our website. And, uh, you know, and then, yeah. But it does go out into our emails, our email announcements. If you don't get our email blasts, um, please make sure you fill out a new visitor's card. I'm going to have this and we'll put you on list, and we'll make sure to get you uh, on the uh, you know, prompt uh, I think that's about it. We'll go ahead and bless the, the, the Z and the Y. Y is fruit of the vine, so this is grape juice. And this is so that we do not have to wait um, to go out and have somebody else bless the food out there. This is the blessing for that. Um, and we do invite our visitors um, to go through our line first, uh, so that you make sure that you go out and do that. And the children, please make sure you go through with your parents. Parents, make sure you go through with your children. Okay. The fruit of the vine has always been a symbol of joy. Today I am joyful for, um, for his word. The word that he has given us, the word that he has put in my mouth. Blessed are you, O Lord, now King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Vision. Today I am so grateful for the provision that he has given us of his word so that people might see and know that he is the bread of life. Amen. Please rise.